Great, thanks very much. And by the way, guys, you can ask any questions during it or afterwards, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Um, so very simply what I want to do is, is kind of warn you and kind of if in some ways vaccinate you against getting involved with any cult, but specifically Scientology. And I want to try and show you how easy it is to get involved, because one of the things is, how could you be so stupid? You know, how could you be so gullible? Well, if you're not vulnerable, stupid and gullible, they will try and make you that, using something like that with the free stress test, like we just said. If you're on those cans, they're, they're watching that needle, and like the stress test works like this. They'll ask you, well, think about people in your life, and you'll be thinking about them, and suddenly they'll get a reaction on that needle, and they go, who are you thinking of there? Me, ma'am. The stress there. And then you'll start thinking about all the arguments that you, you had, all the times she tried to like, you know, stop you doing something, she was bossy or whatever. And the more you're doing it, the more the needle will be going, and they'll be going, yeah, yeah, stress. You need to buy this book. Now, oh, I forget the girl's name now, but um, there was a girl, she was actually the daughter of the Norwegian Prime Minister, and she did, not the stress test, she did the personality analysis. And they told her that there was no hope for her in her life unless she did Scientology. And they did such a good job, she went home and killed herself. Right, so we're dealing with something very serious here. Now, in the Scientologist's defense, they actually believe that they're doing the world a favor, otherwise they wouldn't do it, you know. So they think they're doing us all a favor, they think they're doing good. We all know different, because the information's out there that they don't have access to. So, how would you get involved? Well, for me, it's, I tell you, it's a bit like, like you get yourself in, and that's the hardest thing to understand. But every day you make decisions, like you wake up and you go, right, I'll get out of bed now. And then you go, what am I going to wear today? Well, in your case, it's the uniform, you've no choice, right? But other days you might go, well, will I wear that? Or that? So you're making decisions all day long. What will I have to eat? Where will I go? Who will I call? So all day long you're making decisions. It's that easy to get into Scientology. For me, I'm walking past the building and a girl's there going, come and do the free personality test. So it takes a few seconds, but you go, okay, what harm is in there in that? Like, she seems like reasonable. So I've already made a decision that's got me into Scientology of my own free will. I did the personality test. That is 200 questions. Like, imagine sitting down for like half an hour or so, and the answers are yes, no, or maybe. So, I, th I think the first one is, um, do you make thoughtless remarks or accusations which you later regret? You've got to think about the answers, but what's actually happened is you're getting softened up by answering these questions. You know, does emotional music have quite a response on you? Yeah, I like music, yeah, okay. So you're answering all these questions, and then you get the results back, and there's a graph. Now, this is what did it for the Norwegian, um, I wish I could remember her name, I think it's Ballo or something. Um, but she was thoroughly softened up when they started talking to you. Now, there's another thing in Scientology, they have all these policy letters written by the guy who started it, and the idea is to help Scientology to run smoothly. And one of the things is called handling the public individual, which you are if you're not a Scientologist. They've got other names for us as well. Raw meat, wogs is another one, um, humanoids. Oh, it's incredible. They consider themselves homo novice. Like, you know, homo sapien is like man. They are homo novice, new man. <laughs> this is what they believe, though, seriously, absolutely. So this policy, handling the public individual, it says, we've learned the hard way. Never, ever ask a member of the public to decide or choose because we found the hard way he doesn't even know what it is that, it, that he's deciding about, so how could he make the right choice? Okay, that sounds quite believable, you know, because they don't know what the hell they're on about, so we'll tell them. So this is where they come in, and this is when you do your test and you get your results and they go, you need to buy this book. Well, I have no money. You need to buy this book. This is what's going to save you. This is what's going to change your life. This is what's going to handle your, the problems with your mother or whatever it is, you know? So they use it as a sales tool, and that's all it is, and the stress test is exactly the same. And, and I've, I've met little old ladies who, who are on benefits, like, you know, 188 quid a week, and they spent 20 quid on a book just to get out of there because they thought they weren't going to let them go. Now, that's horrible, you know. I mean, it could be your granny, you know, and she spent, like, 10% of her money on a stupid book that she's never going to read, and it's not going to help her anyway because it's 
crap, you know, I don't, you know, to be fair, you know. So that's how you get involved. You make decisions every step of the way. So I do my test and, and they go, oh, well, this shows here that uh, you're depressed. No, I'm not. That's what it says here. This is what you've told us about yourself. I could be happier, right? And then they move on to the next thing. So whether you agree or disagree, they don't argue with you, they move on to the next thing. And there's 10 different traits. I think happy, depressed is the first one. I forget what they all are now, but you've got like uh, composed and unstable. So like, you know, you come to the next one. This says here that you're not very confident. Well, I don't know. Well, it says, so this is what you've told us about yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. So you see how it goes. So basically, they're looking for you to agree with them. Now, in the old days, they used to do an IQ test as well at the end of this. And, you know, an IQ test comes out of whatever number. In Scientology, they've only got two IQ tests. So if you do the, an IQ test today, you do the same test tomorrow, do you think you'd get higher? I think you'd probably get higher. Because you'd be going, oh, I answered, yeah, I think I got that wrong yesterday. You actually do the same two tests, and they say that Scientology increases your IQ. I doubt that very much. I think it lowers it, to be honest. But anyway, so there's me sat there doing, this, doing the test. I've done the test, and like, I've got all these things wrong with me. And the one thing I did agree with was that you can improve. You can be a better person. You, know, you can be more thoughtful, caring, or whatever. You know? So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll buy into that idea. And they said, I, you know, you, you wouldn't believe what you can be like when you handle this reactive mind that you've got. Because they convince you that there's this scientific thing that your unconscious is now called the reactive mind. And all the pain and all the bad stuff is stored in your reactive mind. And that's what's causing your problems. That's why when everyone, whenever you get remi remi reminded of uh, the time you argued with your mom, it all comes back and you mm, you know, all the emotions come up. That's your reactive mind. Get rid of that and you'd be like a perfect computer. Nothing wrong with you, nothing to cause you any problems. If you've got any questions, just ask, right? So, um, so that's what, what kind of happens there. Um, then they go, well, you need to buy five hours of Dianetics auditing, because they don't even call it Scientology at this stage. They hide it under Dianetics. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I can't afford it, you know? Well, what do you have? And they actually will ask you, what? financial resources you do have. And if you've got money in the bank, they will go with you to the ATM and then take it off you. They, they will actually do that. In fact, someone I know, and he's suing them, you can read about this, it was in phoenix.ie. Kevin Stevenson gave them over 100 grand. And he knows he did it, he just doesn't know why. <laughs> he's like, what? Well, one day, he went with the two head honchos from here. They took him to the bank, he went in, he got uh, overdraft arranged for 20 grand. He came out with the check and he just gave it to them. And of course, ah, oh, thanks Kevin, your eternity is you know, assured now. You're gonna live forever, yay. <laughs> and that's the kind of bullshit that they come out with. But um, that was that particular case and that's going to court. So we'll see what happens there. They offered him, I think, something like 50,000 and a gag order, which means that if he takes the 50,000, he's not allowed to talk about Scientology. And he told them to get lost, so that's pretty good. So I was faced with the problem, like, I did have a bit of cash there, but it was to pay for the mortgage next month. So again, I'm making decisions. Well, these people seem quite nice. They seem quite friendly. They made me a cup of coffee, and, you know, it's all very, you know, I like it, you know. And they seem convinced that this stuff's going to help me. And they even said that, you know, well, it's only one mortgage payment. What's that compared to your entire future? And you take the brakes off. You get rid of this reactive mind and you'll be able to make money like no one ever could before. And you, ah, imagine what you could be like, you know, way. Hey. So I'm like, yeah, ah, go on, go on, what the hell, you know, I'll, I'll take a chance. And that's exactly what I did. And that's exactly how I got involved. And that's how easy it can be. Of course, then when they tried the procedure out on me, What's going on there is a, is a very subtle form of hypnosis. So you sat there, your eyes are closed, and you're thinking back, and you, you remember painful stuff. And the way they do it is you talk about some painful incident from the very beginning to the very end. So that just as an example, say you get hurt on the football field. They would have you go to the start of that incident, and your eyes are closed, and you're thinking, well, I'm running down, I got the ball, and this guy comes in, and oh, man, oh, wow, yeah. 
And then, all right, okay, so go back to the beginning and go over it again. So you go, all right, well, I've got the ball, and I'm running around, guy, oh, gee, that hurts. And you'll feel the pain again, because you sat there thinking about it, and you know, it becomes very, very real. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then they'll say, okay, go back to the beginning and go over it again. And you do this and do this until you go, oh, God, do I have to do this again? You know, I can't stand this. Like, you know, or you'll start laughing and feeling better, and they go, great, end of session. Because then you feel really good, suddenly. Now, what you've done, do you, have you ever tried that thing where if you say a word over and over and over, it loses its meaning? Right, like Jiminy Jellicas in The Simpsons, that one. Do you ever hear that one? Lost, lost all meaning. Well, it's the same kind of a thing that's going on. If you repeat something over and over and over and over, it loses its meaning. And that's what's going on. But they're doing it with your mind and your memories and your painful memories. And you may remember things that you've forgotten. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I was lying there, just after I'd been hit, that guy from the other team came up and called me a prick. I remember that now. I'd forgotten about that. And that would make you feel good, because you've forgotten about something that happened. Because when you get knocked to the, you know, when you get hurt, when you're in an accident, part of your mind is somewhere else. There's no question about that. But they use all this, and they try and basically use that to you know, to make you think that something's happened. And that's the dangerous thing, because then you convince that it works, and then you go on. Can I just ask, do you yeah. know about before? I had heard something about it, yeah, because I used to read a lot, and I read a lot of uh, an author called William Burroughs, and he'd yeah. done it, and he turned his back on it. Yeah. And I quite liked William Burroughs, the author, but I thought, well, you know, he must have missed something, because this seems okay to me. So no Oh, there was, yeah, straight away. I, like, I've heard that this is a cult and it's dangerous. Yeah. But you know something? I didn't have the evidence. Yeah. Like, it's not, like, I mean, we are so lucky today because we've got computers, we've got, you know, we, we've got the internet, you know, so we can go on. The information is, is absolutely there. Go ahead. What's the, what's the, the book that I think about it? What's it about? Yeah. It's simply about, like, imagine you've got this unconscious part of your mind called the reactive mind. They want you to get rid of every single painful memory that's in there by doing exactly what I just said. You go over and over and over and over until when you think about it, you just go, meh. You know, it doesn't bother you anymore. Even serious things, very serious things, so you know. You know your past well, what they say happens is that once you get the emotional charge off the incident, which yeah. can include pain, yeah. the incident files itself in your normal memory banks. Now, there's no basis for any of this in science, but yeah. this is what they say. So if you didn't have much of a scientific or psychological background, yeah. you could buy into it. Yeah. But it's quackery. It really is, you know. Do you, uh, do you get people to join the cult when you go Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I've since tried to apologize to them. <laughs> That's the first thing I did when I realized. But here's an interesting thing. Um, I actually got kicked out in 1994 for not producing. They don't like people who don't produce. I wasn't selling the right number of books. And it went on for six weeks, and that was it. But I stayed reasonably friendly, and I still held to the beliefs and the ideas for another 14 years until the protests kicked off here in Dublin. And I'm like, why are you protesting against those guys? They, they, they are going to save the world. They've got the drug rehabilitation technology. They, got this, uh, they can rehabilitate prisoners. They can do this. They can do that. And just like for the record, the aims of Scientology are to create a world without insanity, crime, and war. So that's what they're going for, and they believe they can do it. Yeah. So you know, they're great aims. I mean, I think we all want that. You know, uh, but like, they can't actually achieve it. And like, 60 years in existence, or slightly more, and I don't think they've achieved anything. In fact, they've actually made the place worse. Let's be honest. You know. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Absolutely, it is a money-making racket. The guy who started it, uh, one of his policy letters actually does say, make money, make more money, get other people to produce so as to make more money. That's the policy letter. I mean, so that, was, that was the kind of which you were kicked out then, because you weren't... I wasn't making the money. And here's another interesting thing as well. There's another policy letter, what's it called? Ethics protection, it's called. And they say that if you're producing, then you could get away with murder. He actually does say that, and whether he means it or not, I don't know. Uh, if your statistics are down, in other words, if you're not producing, you can't sneeze. And they actually say that. So there's been people, that, okay, this is something you could look up, but I don't recommend you do. 
Um, it's an audio of a Scientologist, high-level Scientologist, called Wally Hanks beating a 15-year-old boy. Okay? Now, how they got the audio, I don't know, but you can tell it's real, and it's one of the most horrible things to listen to. Uh, it's not good. Um, you can tell that the guy's obviously some kind of you know, sick, twisted individual. But Wally Hanks never got into any trouble. They never reported him to the law. He's also supposedly molested teenage girls as well. So there's a big history behind this guy. He got away with it because he was making half a million a year for Scientology. And that's the attitude they've got. So whatever you're doing, they will let you get away with it as long as you're making money for them. And that, you know, what, what kind of a religion is that? It's not, it's not a religion. They say it is, but it's absolutely not a religion, you know. Go ahead. The only thing we've got the children's or whatever. Yeah. What would they do? Would they ever have to take admins on? Well, the church? Yes, they would. No, no. I mean, I mean the, the church as it exists is, okay, there's a lot of things wrong, mm. but people are trying to change that, so that's positive. Yeah, well, they're saying they're a religion. Right. Same thing when we, when we have gatherings like masses, is that what you're saying? Yeah, masses. They, they, they don't. Oh, no, no, they don't do services. Look, and, and the people who are in it, they know it's not a religion. We got, like, when I was in, we got this instruction down. If anyone from the local council comes round and wants to see Sunday services, give it to them. You know, Sunday services, what are we going to do? Oh, I'll just read something from L. Ron Hubbard. Oh, OK. And that's what we were told. It was like to fool the local authorities into thinking that we were doing Sunday services. They do not. Um, the word church itself is actually used to describe a Christian. Uh, building and the people that go and they've actually like taken the word church and by calling themselves the Church of Scientology it makes it sound religious I wouldn't even use the word church with regard to them I would simply call it the cult of Scientology because that's what it is and they hate being called a cult they're also good at hiding behind things like like Dianetics in my opinion is based on hypnosis the founder says this is not hypnosis. Hypnosis puts you asleep. We are waking you up. So they hide the fact that it is hypnosis by telling you that it's not. Now, that's, that's the easiest way to fool someone, is just to outright lie. And he actually says that as well. Um, the only way to control someone is to lie to him. You can write that down in your book in big black letters. They're the exact words he says. So he knows what he's doing. Um, the whole thing is based on deceiving people, lying to them, and it's all about how much money do you have in your bank. It's all about, does you, I mean, there's even been cases where, like, you know, like Granny's inheritance has came down and they've been round there at midnight and stayed till four in the morning until it's all been signed away. I mean, that's happened regularly. Yeah, regularly. How many members do you think there's one over there? Give me that again. How many members? In Ireland? They've all together. Oh, in the world? It's very difficult to say. They claim millions. The truth is, there's no way. They have these big events, they have one every two months, and the big one is called the International Association of Scientologists event. They have it in England. They have 3,000 there the last day. The Sun, the Sun uh, newspaper got in there and took pictures and everything and reported that they were saying, what? Uh, <laughs> what were they saying now? I can't remember. Um, uh, what was it? Oh, psychiatrists caused the Holocaust. That's what, that's what they were saying. And all the Scientologists were going, yeah, yeah, get the psycho. Oh, they also caused 9-11. Um, they also caused Kurt Cobain's uh, suicide. Oh, it's crazy. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's hilariously funny. How are we doing? Yeah, no. See, see, Say that again. Yeah, but it's not a church, it's, it's a building. I mean, it's just like this, you know. Um, what, what you do is you do this auditing procedure where, you know, you're, you're talking about yourself and they call that your case and you end up with all these folders where all these notes are in. And this is quite an interesting thing because you also do what's called confessional auditing. And we all know what confessions are. And you confess to everything. And they say that, you know, as long as you're a loyal Scientologist, then, you know, these things will remain... Absolutely. But guess what happens? The numbers of people that can read that folder at about over, it was over 40. So that's not very secret for a start. I mean, there's not even 40 people in here, you know. Yeah, we were talking about different stages of it. You know, when you go and get water up and yeah, all, yeah. people walk through, they say you can walk through all. They say, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you walk through all? What were the stages? 
Okay, it starts off very simply. Okay, first of all, you've got to go from being a WOG to being a Scientologist, and they've got to raise your awareness to do that. So they have all these introductory courses and free services. And I'll just say as well at this point that the only free courses in Scientology are courses that teach you how to sell Scientology to people you know. So everything else you pay for. But what you do is you go up this, like, like they call it a grade chart. It starts off with all these different grades, zero, one, two, three, four, and then you go clear. And when you're clear, you don't have your reactive mind. But what it actually says there is you don't have your own reactive mind. And I'll come back to that because it's kind of strange. So at the grade zero level, it's called communication. And the end result of doing grade zero is the ability to talk with anyone on any subject. So you think, OK, that's kind of, I'd like that. You know, that would be handy enough. Then you get to the next level, which is called problems. And the end result of that is the ability to recognize the source of problems and make them vanish. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. But like, I suppose if you've got a problem with your mom, then you go, mom's the problem. You know, or, or whatever. I don't know. But you're supposed to be able to do this. And then grade two is relief from the hostilities and sufferings of life. And then there's grade three and grade four. I, I forget exactly what they are. But when you get to clear, you no longer have your own reactive mind. So in other words, you won't have any uh, compulsions or fears. Um, and that's actually quite funny. There's a girl, um, uh, who, she's actually not from, uh, from near here. And she was doing auditing. And the person that was auditing her was clear. And suddenly a spider came down, right? And she went, ah! And, yeah. And the girl goes, but hang on, mate, you're meant to be clear and you're not supposed to be afraid of spiders. And she went, it's a spider! <laughs> so, so there you go. I mean, and then another one, another one, there's like an old guy called Phil Spickler. And he was the father of a girl called Mimi Rogers. And she's the woman who got Tom Cruise. Yeah, she got Tom Cruise into Scientology. So it's her dad, and he's been in Scientology a long time. He's not in now. Loads of people. There's more people out than in, that's for sure. And most people don't want to talk about it. They're just glad to escape in one piece, you know. But Phil said, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say that they do tend to keep family members, someone that joins, someone that joins Scientology, if there's family members that disagree with it. Totally, totally. The girl I mentioned, she's called Gabrielle Wynn. You can, you can see her online. Um, she left because they said that she would have to disconnect from her mother, which means like you separate from her, have nothing to do with her, because she's a suppressive person. And if you're against Scientology, they say you're a suppressive person. And I actually read something I'd not seen before, I'd heard about it, but it was a list of 12 people, and it said these people are declared suppressive persons and enemies of mankind. <laughs> I mean, what? Um, <laughs> yeah, No way. And she came in like they were coming in to talk to him. She came in to talk to us and she got upset. And she said that he has cut all ties with his family. And she said it's like a death to the family. And we can't contact him and we can't see him. And I think her name, her, her second name is Robinson. You know, I know her, I, I know her actually, yeah. She's. He is, yeah. She's actually, a, I, I don't mind mentioning that name because she's kind of public about it. Um, yeah, that's an incredible story. He was on the Late Late Show as well. Yeah, he was. And then he's gone to America. He's living there. Um, they, he's had a daughter since, and the family haven't met her or anything like that. And he actually said to them, if you make any attempt to contact me, I'll just move somewhere else and you won't find me again. Now, I was contacted only this week by somebody in England to try and find the brother who went missing in 1994. Uh, and, and again, like all these things happen around Scientology, and you never get to the truth. Because you know, like, it, it, like, I mean, they're absolutely criminal, but you can't prove it. And it's a danger to people's lives. Totally, it's absolutely. There's a, there's a website called Why Are They Dead? Lisa McPherson, Lisa McPherson was, was unbelievable. I mean, she went clear, so obviously all the problems were supposedly yeah. gone. And she had a car accident and went a bit loopy. She took off all the clothes and started running around the streets. So she was picked up and taken to a psychiatric hospital, which you probably normally do. Scientologists heard about this, and they're dead against psychiatry, absolutely dead against it. 
So three of them went in there and brought her out, against her wishes, mind, because she was actually, you know, not, well, she had no wishes to make, she, she was gone, you know. And they held her in a room for 14 days. She died of dehydration. She was covered in cockroach bites. After four days, the place they had her, her screams could be heard by all the other people, and it was like, what's going on there? Too many questions were being asked. And I only found out this fairly recently. They duct taped her wrists and ankles and mouth. They put her in a locker and shipped her off in a, in a, in a van to another location where she could scream all she wanted and nobody would hear her. She was like bruised on her hands because she'd been beating the walls. She was, they tried to force feed her with like a turkey baster. Um, it's, just, it's just horrible. And what's happened with that death is that they've just covered it up. They've, um, they put pressure on the original, uh, who makes the death report? Coroner, is it, in the States? They put pressure on her to change her original verdict because they've got millions, you know. And it's like, if there's someone over here going, tell the truth, tell the truth, and somebody over there going, here's a million dollars, just fuck off, you know. <laughs> you know but that's what, that's what, that's what they do. Uh, totally, totally, totally. There's another case, sorry, uh, Kyle Brennan, another one, a young lad, he was 20 years old. He was on psychiatric medication because he was slightly depressed. He had exams coming up. He's like, ah, I can't stand it, give me something. They gave him a mild tranquilizer. He was found dead, uh, shot. He didn't have powder marks on his hands, so he didn't, he didn't pull the trigger. And that is, that's an ongoing case right now. That happened in 2007. And that's been covered up and delayed, and it's just unbelievable, you know? So you don't want to end that anymore? Say that again? I don't know you want to end the whole anymore. Yeah. Could they? You got that same high school coach or anything else? Yeah, they tried. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, they hate it. They'd be going mental right now. We had a conference last June at the Teachers Club on Parnell Square, and they sent two people, <laughs> this is funny, they sent two people around there, and they actually, there's two women, one was from England, called Lady Margaret McNair. Doesn't that sound great? And they went in there, we, we, we've, got, we've got them on the, on the CCTV going in, and they went up to the guy who runs it, you know, and he's a wonderful guy, and they said, um, we think it would be in your best interests not to hold this conference. And he just turned around and said, fuck off. <laughs> That's absolutely true. OK. Yeah, so, I mean, they, they, do, they do. And while the conference was going on, they, they were trying to give me hell. Um, apparently, I, I make gay, no, not gay, child porno movies in Germany. I've never been to Germany, you know. OK, lads, uh, big round of applause for uh, Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Sir Michael. Thanks, guys, as well. Yeah. Thanks.